they're taking U.S. empire out of it and they're having it basically be a direct weapon of the bankers. So instead of the bankers like buying up U.S. politicians and influencing U.S. empire and getting what they want that way, they're reimagining it uh, to basically create this uh, new economic system that we've seen bits of over the over the you know past few years. The idea of programmable, surveillable mon- money, and also this idea of a voluntary carbon market. The goal of which is to have it be voluntary in name only. Not unlike digital ID and and all of that stuff. The IMF, the World Bank, intimately tied with U.S. empire. The U.S. military even admitted in documents that were published by WikiLeaks that they're financial weapons of the U.S. military, the uh-huh. IMF and the World Bank. Investigative journalist Whitney Webb recently issued a stark warning about BlackRock and Wall Street, highlighting the development of a new system of programmable money. This system is designed to be controlled and directed exclusively by authorities and elites. Webb, a columnist and researcher, shared her insights on the Jimmy Dore podcast, where she elaborated on her concerns regarding the elite class's intentions for the general populace. According to Webb, these elites aim to gain control over all assets and introduce carbon credits under the guise of environmental protection. However, she believes this is just the beginning with more complex and invasive plans on the horizon. Make sure to watch until the end of the video, as Witty Webb delves deeper into these alarming developments and the potential implications for our privacy, autonomy, and freedom. If you enjoy finance-related content, consider subscribing to the channel or liking the video. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. It's been criticized by people on the left and the right. Um, and then there's been time and time again, it's been revealed by even mainstream media. This You can look at um, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero that was created by Mark Carney and Mike Bloomberg, which somehow the UN decided were the best people for the job of saving the planet. They're in charge of climate finance for the United Nations, uh, the stop and frisk New York mayor billionaire from Solomon Brothers, Mike Bloomberg, and the head of a uh, former head of the uh, Bank of England and Bank of Canada and former Goldman Sachs guy, Mark Carney. That's who's saving the planet for the UN. Like if you so were- they're the ones reimagining this, uh, the whole multilateral development banking system. And part of this is, involves this carbon market uh, play where the World Bank, along with Google um, and some other actors are developing Uh, climate wallets. They're designing it. It's designed to run on, um, I believe, the Chia network, which is the guy that uh, invented BitTorrent, his new project. And um, they claim to be sort of like a net zero blockchain, I guess. And basically the idea of it um, is uh, for people to participate in the carbon market to come. And the idea um, of people being able to sort of like monetize nature And there's a whole lot of stuff going on with carbon credits and carbon markets right now. And it's a very murky legal area. And I'm very concerned about it because there's this whole mentioned but relatively unexplored issue of so-called carbon rights, where the person that buys the carbon credit can get rights to the carbon in the forest the credit represents. Does that make sense? Yes. So So like... I buy a carbon credit in this forest, uh, this Colombian rainforest, and now I am the potentially the owner of the carbon in those trees, so I can decide what happens to that carbon. And the people that actually like own the land are like Colombians, you know, they don't necessarily own it anymore, potentially. This is like this murky gray area, so it's opening the way up, I think, to some land grabs um, in uh, in the global south. So a lot of very uh, disturbing things happening in carbon market land. And even under the idea of, you know, reducing CO2 levels and all of that, um, the carbon market as it's been functioning, um, you know, just hasn't done that. It's been criticized by people on the left and the right. Um, and then there's been time and time again, it's been revealed by even mainstream media that up to 90% of all carbon credits on the market right now are completely worthless and meaningless. So it's basically like the junk bond scandal of the 1980s again. And what's interesting is that the person that invented carbon markets and carbon credit trading is a guy named Richard Sander, who worked at Drexel Burnham Lambert, the junk bond scandal bank of the 1980s. Ah. He was a senior vice president until he was uh, brought in by the George Bush senior administration to apply free markets to environmental issues for Bush Sr.'s EPA, and then was contacted by this like Rockefeller oligarch guy uh, who was at the UN named Marie Strong to develop the same solution for carbon. And he's also the father of derivatives of financial futures, which of course helped explode in 2008. 
Oh. Uh, so the guy that invented all of that is the guy that invented carbon credit trading, and he also wants to make a, a market just like that for free water and free air, so you can, uh, you know, get basically taxed on that too. I think a lot of this we're uh, going to be seeing going forward this push to um, have economically destabilized countries in Latin America turn towards dollar denominated stable coins like that's happening in Argentina for example because of like the issues with the peso there and how it's been devalued uh, so much even under Malay people are flocking to um dollars essentially but like stable coins either uh, like tether USDT or circles USDC um and this whole crypto ecosystem in Argentina is pretty much, you know, largely managed by this one particular network that's intimately tied to the satellite company I was talking about. Uh, they're all tied up with this group called Endeavor, which Endeavor has an Argentina branch. They have branches really all over the world. They're based in the United States. Uh, the, their board is chaired by Edgar Bronfman Jr. of the Bronfman family, which if you're familiar with uh, my books, um, is a, intimately tied to organized crime and basically the people behind Justin Trudeau. Um, <laughs> and uh, another person on their board is Reed Hoffman, who's the co-founder of LinkedIn, who was uh, a member, not you know, a part of the so-called PayPal mafia. Um, and probably the closest person on Silicon in Silicon Valley. Reid Hoffman um, is a big funder of sort of uh, of Democrat causes and the Democrats, but other members of the quote unquote PayPal mafia are very much uh, supportive of Trump. Uh, for example, Peter Thiel was a big force on uh, Trump's transition team. Uh, people that worked very closely for Thiel and Thiel's Palantir uh, basically directed all the um, the early policy decisions and appointments of Trump's Department of Defense. Um, and there's been a lot of connections, I think, still um, between PayPal Mafia and and Trump. And you have someone like Elon Musk also sort of posturing publicly anyway as a libertarian. And sort of in that right populist camp. Um, so I don't think I think um, you know, this particular um, this particular network has people who sort of play to both sides of the political machine, which is frankly, you know, if you want to get lots of lucrative government contracts, I mean, that's what you do. Frankly, it's hard to know where we will be, but I think it's pretty clear that there's certain efforts to push people in a particular direction. So um, I think it's been clear for a long time, and as I'm sure you're aware, there's a push to onboard everyone to a digital ID system. Vaccine passports during COVID were a big part of this. But there's been all sorts of pushes for it. For example, WorldCoin, Sam Altman, scan your eyeball, uh, get a unique digital ID in a wallet you can have tokens in. Uh, people in in uh, in the global south that like are they're basically being bribed to give up their biometric data for the guy that runs OpenAI with Microsoft and stuff. Um, uh, there's uh, these digital ID inter um, like initiatives are consistently tested on vulnerable stateless people, but the goal is to have it rolled out globally and to have it be interfaced with a digital wallet where the money is programmable and surveillable. So a lot of people have been talking about CBDCs central bank uh, issued digital currency. Uh, but there's also going to be digital currencies just as surveillable and programmable that are issued by the private sector in the Wall Street banks. And that isn't being talked about enough. Right. So one of the stable coins I mentioned earlier that people in Argentina are being rapidly onboarded to because their currency is being destroyed, uh, Tether uh, recently onboarded the FBI and Secret Service to its platform. <laughs> so everyone that uses Tether gets to uh, use their money under the watchful eye of American intelligence, essentially. Um, and those same actors, the FBI and the Secret Service, are part of this public-private partnership uh, housed within the World Economic Forum. It's basically U.S., um, Israeli and U.K. intelligence, plus a lot of big banks and PayPal. Um, uh, their ambition is to end online anonymity and with that also financial anonymity. So we're seeing unprecedented uh, crackdowns on, uh, you know, a b financial privacy tools, both for cryptocurrency and for regular transactions and big pushes uh, from all across uh, the Internet, really, to have you tie your government issued ID to what you do online, whether it's your social media account or really anything. Um, and so the, the goal here is to have, a, you know, create a, a completely surveillable uh, system based on biometrics and with money that the government 
or whoever can directly program and surveil. So programming, it means that you can only use the money for what they say you can use it for and you can only send it to who they say you can send it to. Yeah. And the goal is to onboard the whole world onto that. And they consistently test the stuff first in a global south. So what on the global south. So like what this article is about is a big effort um, to essentially wrap up a significant amount of Latin America by focusing at the subnational level, the local level, uh, onto these kinds of systems under the guise of we must decarbonize now. Yeah. Um, but really, the if you look at sort of like the fine print, I guess you could say, of this program, the decarbonization funds go toward a specific company uh, that's tied up with this particular group uh, that's trying to build an intercontinental power smart grid uh, from the Americas, and they've been testing their smart grid uh, in on um, in uh, poor communities in Latin America, in Los Angeles, actually in the U.S., and also in Colombia and some other countries, with the idea of having it um, all tied together and having energy be currency. And the idea is to move away um, from you know currency as we know it now and have all these commodity-backed currencies and that people trade energy or trade carbon credits. Um, and basically, um, it's complicated. There's a lot of different reasons for why they're moving in that direction. Part of it is because of the insane amount of debt that the world is saddled with. Um, you have to park that debt in certain places. You have to um, find ways to manage it, right? And so, you know, some of these stable coins are being used for that. Uh, carbon credits are being used for that. Actually, RFK's vice president, uh, Nicole Shanahan, uh, was running uh, or managing um, a project at Stanford Law that was about using carbon credits to uh, facilitate quantitative easing, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, the endless money printing by the Federal Reserve. So there's been a lot of, um, you know, efforts to look at what they're going to do with the debt. And essentially, they have to remake the financial system. Uh, but they're, you know, making it in a way where it's, um, you know, completely completely surveillable and controllable. And these are really the ambitions that the U.S. national security state uh, had right after 9-11 and tried to impose on everybody. Uh, total information awareness, for example, uh, was a program that they tried to um, enact. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a big uproar about it at the time in like 2003, 2004, because even the New York Times and stuff knew that it was going to completely eliminate privacy for the average American. Um, and so... Uh, the ambition of this program was to surveil literally everything, including people's like health signals to prevent pandemics before they can happen, uh, to prevent financial crime before it can happen.